We used to think the Earth was the center of the solar system. And this theory caused a lot of confusion when we studied space because we couldn't make sense of the planetary orbits. The planets seemed to behave in very erratic ways. It wasn't until the development of the heliocentric model by Nicholas Copernicus where we realized that all the planets revolved around the sun. And only then were we able to understand the orbits of each planet. Things started to make a lot more sense. And we were able to unlock all sorts of new discoveries, which ultimately led to the age of science and what we know today. As humans, we're naturally self-centered, so it doesn't really surprise me that initially we thought the whole solar system revolved around us. And as designers, we're not exempt from this solipsism. Unfortunately, a lot of our beloved processes still think in that early self-centric mentality. We often think of our product as the center of our user's world. We use design techniques and research methods which reflect this mentality. We fall in love with our products and we assume or hope that our users will too. We don't really understand why our users seem to behave erratically with our products. We see them behaving like this with our product at the center of their solar system. But the reality is our product is not the center of our user's world. And things aren't gonna truly click for us. Things aren't gonna really make sense until we understand our user's solar system. And until we start designing a product to fit into that world, not vice versa. I have to thank Renato Verdugo, a researcher at YouTube who introduced me to this concept. He doesn't know it, but I saw him speak last year at a conference where he shared this metaphor and it really had a profound effect on me. It's changed the way I approach design and it really reinforced the power of ethnographic research. Ethnographic research allows us to understand the context our product is slotting into. It provides the solar system to our planet. Rather than labs research where we expect users to fit into our world for our needs, in order to maximize our time, it's a more humble approach, asking us to step into their world at perhaps inconvenient times. Which is how I found myself up at three o'clock in the morning at a Tesco warehouse in the middle of nowhere, standing in a giant freezer amidst rows of trays of food stacked far above my head. It's how I found myself sitting down with a couple to book their dream holiday, a honeymoon that they've been planning for a long, long time and been thinking about ever since they got engaged. It's only by going out and doing this sort of field research that we can understand how our products fit into people's lives. We were engaged by a travel brand to help them with their website. They wanted to better understand how they can improve it. But for them, it was very much a self-service or after-sales channel. Their primary channel was their travel stores. Initially, we did some usability testing on the website, but we really wanted to understand where the website fit into the customer journey and where in their service model it was appropriate for it to be introduced. This meant visiting their stores and sitting in on people booking their dream holidays, as well as speaking to staff and just generally taking in the environment. It was quickly apparent that where the website fit into the service model wasn't quite how the brand had at first perceived it. And that's because when we went and visited the stores and sat down with sales representatives or watched people booking their dream holidays, it was pretty clear that the website was front and center. You can see here clearly in this picture that a large Apple cinema display is being used to show a relatively small photo of someone's dream holiday vacation. This simple piece of research and this simple finding was enough to prompt a very simple change to the website that made it a lot more effective, not just for those at home planning holidays, researching them or following up after, after interviews in store, but also for the in-store experience for customers. And it was only by going out and doing that sort of field research and visiting the stores as customers do 
that we could identify this opportunity. We've been working now with Tesco, Britain's largest retailer, for many years. And for them, understanding where they fit into a customer's life, but also understanding their own large organization is one of the key challenges for user experience designers. Tesco have 450,000 employees, 6,800 stores globally, and service 79 million shopping trips a year. For them, the efficiency of their operation and all of the work that goes on behind the scenes to deliver their, for their customers is a huge amount of work. And we've been working closely with them to help improve that through user experience research. So back to my 3 a.m. visit. I was observing a very specific task within our user's workflow, within an internal tool, a product that I was going to be handling. If I had asked these users to come in for lab testing, I would have received feedback along these lines. They would have told me the task is easy. In fact, it's probably one of the easiest parts of their job. They would have told me their process, that it involves printing off a piece of paper, filling in some names, top to bottom to avoid some bias, which was important, and then it's done. And that that was enough for everybody to know what they needed to do for the next step. But what I would have missed is the context that our users are in. I wouldn't have seen how hard it was to find the sheet to print off in the first place, or how poor the formatting was. I wouldn't have seen how many different systems and papers and whiteboards were relied upon to extract a small amount of data required to complete this task. I wouldn't have seen how the existing solution was so poor that it actually created many inconsistent homebrew workarounds. And crucially, I wouldn't have had a true understanding of how long the task actually took to complete. Our users, it turned out, were so used to these workarounds because they've been doing them for so long. Their perception of the task was that it was easy. They were blind to how poor the user experience really was. Through ethnographic research, I also saw this task being completed at one of the busiest times of day, for them, three o'clock in the morning, where they were in charge of a huge operation across multiple teams. They were being interrupted constantly to answer questions or direct crucial parts of the operation. I saw them get distracted and forget where they were and have to start all over again. I saw how much information they had to remember and retain in their heads in order to complete this easy task. I saw how little the system was doing to help them through their task, given the busyness of their operation. And finally, I observed a heap of secondary inefficiencies, not directly related to the task at hand, but still fundamental to the success of the operation. These valuable insights have led to new initiatives and have helped prioritize their roadmap. We were able to unlock new design opportunities for innovation, which has allowed Tesco to scale their operations effectively and efficiently. It's been a great demonstration of the value of what design can bring to a large organization where we've been able to identify quick wins, prioritize initiatives, and unlock new opportunities for success through very targeted research. And prioritization is so important. For businesses that want to improve their operations, they need to understand how all of the different moving parts work together and really where the, you know, the, most effort, uh, the least effort is going to have the most impact for them. The first 747 um, flew in 1969, kicking off the jumbo jet era and the democratization of international travel. Many of the systems that power the travel industry date back to that era. There's a lot of 70s mainframe systems behind the scenes and a lot of terminal applications. The assumption often with these old pieces of software is that they don't work, they're old, they need to be ripped out and they need to be replaced with new shiny systems. And often that's true. Only by seeing where these systems fit into a larger whole 
can we understand where the opportunities really lie to improve upon them? Something we observe with some of these old terminal applications that were keyboard driven is that the staff that were using them were absolutely super efficient. The way they could quickly interrogate the systems, look up flights, see when the opportunities for a great holiday were and where the best prices were, was super impressive. And the customers clearly felt that they were getting some expertise that they wouldn't have got from sitting at home looking at online travel sites. One of the systems that most frustrated the travel representatives we spoke to in store was actually one of the newer mouse driven web applications that they were using. And the thing that annoyed them the most about it, they weren't as quick with the keyboard. For them, the efficiency of the old systems was worth it, even though they had a steep learning curve. The solution to that isn't necessary to keep them around, but it's to make sure that any new systems we introduce are also designed for this efficiency and speed of use, not just for their intuitive ease of use on first time. So it's only by going out and exploring the galaxy around us and exploring the wider universe that we can understand really where these opportunities lie. It's about stepping away from our labs and our own products and going into the world of our users and our customers. So we've, we've gone out into the wider world, out into the wider universe. How do we bring back what we found? Humans are hardwired for storytelling. We've been telling stories as long as there's been a language to tell them. We think in stories, we remember in stories, we turn just about every experience into a story. We've already heard this morning from Alex and Jamie about Daniel Kahneman's peak end rule and how our memories are stories fueled by emotion. This is a quote from the New York Times from a professor of psychology, Drew Weston. And it really emphasizes how storytelling is fundamentally part of our DNA. Think back to the first time you rode a bike. You can probably remember it. I think we all can, even if it was many, many, many years ago. Now, the majority of us probably won't remember any facts, like what was the temperature? What was the weather doing? What were we wearing? Or where exactly we were? Or who we were with and what they were wearing? But we do remember the experience. We do have a story to tell about that first time that we rode a bike. One of the most important things to do when running ethnographic research is to take tons of videos and pictures. It's so crucial when in the field as it will be a powerful tool in relaying the stories that you've gathered. Photos are really good because you can map them into a storyboard. So here we have a typical experience map, as we're probably all familiar with, it's a tool we use all the time. But we've included our photos into the output. So here we were mapping the process for quality inspections in Tesco depots. And this was invaluable when explaining the story back to our developers. We were able to include all the typical data points that you would in a normal experience map, like your pain points and your needs and your opportunities. But adding the images really helped bring in the context of what we'd seen, the environment that our users were in. It helped us establish that solar system. We've also created visual picture decks to illustrate stories, focusing here on the challenges that our users were facing as a result of certain system inadequacies and the environment that they were in. We, we used these stories to tell over and over and over to our stakeholders, and to new team members when they were onboarding into our, into our product team. And each picture really acts as a prompt to the insight that we needed to relay, which ultimately makes remembering your presentation really easy when you have all of these picture prompts in front of you. In a lab setting, we usually spend a lot of time in analysis. We create spreadsheets upon spreadsheets. We extract the data. We run prioritization ex exercises for each item. Whereas with ethnographic research, often a story is enough. A picture tells a thousand words. If we think back to Stephen's story just now about the travel agency, 
all it really takes is that one picture of the iMac and you can see how small the photo is against a big on a big screen and you can understand the context and the problem. Thanks, Daria. So hopefully we whetted your appetite to go out and do some field research. But it, there's some big challenges around field research. So here we're going to give you some tips on how you can get the best out of it. The first of those is that you have to plan around other people's diaries. It's not as easy as scheduling a series of interviews all in a day. You need to budget a lot more time between visiting places and you might need to spend a lot more time there than you might for going to interview someone. We found that this allows for lots of opportunity to do analysis between visits. When you're there, focus on the key moments. This is the beginning of things, opening up shop, starting the day. It's busy periods when lots of people are coming and going, when the shift changes. But it's also the quiet periods when people fill their time, catch up on work or emails that they, they've fallen behind on. And, and likewise, in depots, we've seen people you know, catch up on, on the, the piles of paper that have accumulated. It's also about the handover between people and the end of things, the end of shifts, the end of the working day, or when people leave somewhere. When you're there, try to capture as much as you can. That's things like behaviours, what people are doing around you that you observe. That's the environment itself, the signage, um, things that are left out, things that are put away, how those things are put away. It's the tools and the systems and the touch points that people are using. It's the pieces of paper, it's the IT systems they're using, but it's also their phones and pens and clipboards. Try to think of it like a documentary maker. Zoom out and capture the whole scene, but then zoom in on particular details. And how do you capture everything? It's a lot to document. We found that the Surefire kit to do so is a phone for capturing audio, taking videos, or taking photos. It's a battery pack to make sure that phone lasts all day. It's a clipboard and lots of spare pens because you won't always have an easy writing surface available to you. And because you're using your phone to capture audio or video or take photos, it's hard for it to do two things at once. So we normally take a spare dictaphone and or camera. And I've really found that having a clip on microphone that you can pop on the end of your clipboard is a great way to get much better audio if you do have a few contextual interviews spread across the day. And of course, make sure that you're safe. That means taking appropriate protection for um, coronavirus, but it also means you might have to wear PPE. We often have to wear high-vis jackets and steel toe cap boots when visiting sites of some of our clients. You also have to be adaptable on the day and switch roles quite a bit. Typically, in a lot of interviews, usability testing and lab-based research, you'll have a strict delineation between an interviewer who's driving the interview and a note taker who's capturing everything. But you might have to move around quite a bit during the day when you're in ethnographic settings and, and sit and follow things that pop up. Ultimately, ethnographic field research is some of the most rewarding research that you can do as a UX researcher. We well, hope you've seen some of the benefits of doing this sort of research, but also some tips that you can take away to put it to good use. So make sure that you put your users at the centre of your galaxy and not your own product you'll find everything makes a lot more sense.